Chris, uh, thank you so much for talking to ANI. To begin with, uh, how will the findings of Aditya L1 mission that ISRO is set to launch in some time from now impact human space flight? Well, there's a terrific example in history, Irina. Uh, on this day in the last century, the worst uh, solar event that has ever happened blasted the Earth. A huge blob of energy, of high energy particles, smashed into the Earth. And telegraphs were just new there. And it actually set telegraph machines on fire. And that's going to happen again. So when we put something like Aditya up there uh, in between us and the sun to sense those things, to better understand how the sun works and the threats that it has to the earth, it's, it's good for everybody, for protecting us as people, but also, of course, our electrical grid, our uh, internet grid, and all of the thousands of satellites that we count on that are up in orbit. So it's a really good new scientific probe to have out there teaching us about the sun. Right. Uh, let's just dig a little deeper into what this really means for the international fraternity, not just, you know, ISRO, not just NASA, not just JAXA, but the entire community. Well, everybody on the earth is counting on technology just to have electricity in their homes and businesses, to have communications like you and I are talking to each other now, even to have you know navigation for your car and all, all the rest of it, we are counting on uh, a really complicated, interconnected, global electric and data system. And so the electromagnetic energy that comes from the sun is both uh, a benefit to that, but also a huge threat to that. And so putting a, a new sensor in between us and the sun, that it is looking specifically at how the sun sends out these big damaging uh, ejections of, of, uh, of high energy particles. It's, it's really useful information, not just for ISRO and, and not just for obviously the Indian space uh, program, but it's something that is sort of vital, space weather for the world. Right. Uh, now, uh, India is uh, in, in an upward trajectory when it comes to missions. Uh, now, India has also been talking about human spaceflight missions soon and is collaborating with international space agencies. How do you view India's capabilities of human space mission? Uh, India has been working on having Indian citizens, Indian astronauts in space for several years. They've already chosen uh, at least four uh, Indian astronauts who've been training for a few years. The program is, is uh, I guess it's called uh, the Celestial Craft, uh, Gaganyan. And uh, Gaganyan has already launched some test vehicles. They're launching another test vehicle in about a month, but they're working towards the very first launch of two or three Indian astronauts uh, late next year, maybe 2025. So that's a huge change. There's only been uh, a very few countries on Earth that have been capable of building their own spaceships and their own rockets and launching their own citizens in space. And it's a natural evolution from all of the satellites that have been put up and then the recent moon landing and now going to uh, investigate the sun. It's just a real strong demonstration of the increased capability of Indian technology. And in this case, uh, getting India involved early in the whole Earth Moon economic system that is developing right now, that enormous resource of the moon itself, and being one of the early players uh, in that, in that, it's not really a race, but at least in that game, in that business together. So it's quite a historic moment for India and for the world. Now, you've closely monitored, you know, India's space journey so far. Uh, what is your assessment? What's your impression uh, as, as a former astronaut, as a former uh, commander of the International Space uh, Station? Uh, I work with Indian space companies. I, I, I help run a, a big international technology incubator. And I work with Indian space companies because... It's the same pattern that NASA followed and the European Space Agency. The government uh, does a lot of the early research and development when, when it's not profitable, but someone has to you know, put down the roads and put in the power system and then open it up 
for private industry and, and private business. And that's what's happening in India now. Uh, hundreds of space businesses are, are coming to the fore now. I, I work with a company called Dhruva Space, which already has several private satellites in orbit. And what India offers that is different than most nations in the world is, uh, is an educated workforce, uh, a vast number uh, of people, um, and really high-end technology, all those things. And, and it's not just in space. I mean, it's in um, uh, nuclear power, it's in high-speed trains, it's, it's manifesting itself right across the country. And so I, I think this example of uh, landing on the moon and sending a probe to the sun, and, or at least to go monitor the sun, and getting Indian astronauts ready to fly in space, it provides a really visible example to everybody in India, but to everybody else around the world, of just where Indian technological prowess is right now, and, and sort of a hint of everything that's to come. Now, uh, you, you talked about the human capital, how it's educated, and you know, uh, it's a working force that's educated. Uh, India also carried out this uh, its moon expedition on a rel relatively shoestring budget, which is like just $74 million as compared to, you know, other agencies. Uh, do you agree that Delhi could become a more significant partner of choice for nations eager to reach beyond Earth uh, on this kind of a budget? I think it's really important to put the budget into perspective, Rina. Uh, I mean, $74 million, that's a lot of money by anybody's measure. But if you compare it to everything else that the Indian government is doing, if you compare it to the amount that's spent on, on uh, food distribution or, or the rest of health and welfare for the Indian people, it is like a, a hundredth of 1% of the of the whole budget, the entire Indian space program is is a tiny, tiny little fraction that if it was completely canceled, it wouldn't make any difference perceptibly in the overall budget. So even though that number is large when looked at by itself, when you put it in proportion to the actual cost of running the country, I think it's a really valuable, uh, small sort of uh, table stake in order to make sure that India is not being left behind. And you're right. Uh, in comparison to what other countries spend in order to do something similar, it's one of India's great strengths as well, because of the large population, just because of uh, the, the geopolitical situation and the economic situation. India still has a very large and very inexpensive workforce uh, with a very high education level, and that allows them to build things, not just for Indian purposes, but to sell to the rest of the world. It makes them extremely competitive. And that's quite interesting to me, talking to the Indian private space companies, because they can bring that then to the world marketplace. The, the, as you call it, the shoestring budget, but the, the inexpensive and successful way that India landed on the moon, that is proof positive for all of those Indian space companies that they can do something uh, as well and for a lot less money than the rest of the world. And that that is a really good business model. Uh, while the United States is still the world leader in space exploration, do you think that the space race, or like you said, the space game uh, could be, um, you know, this could be just the beginning or a big change that could be coming? And do you agree that India's mission marks a soft power win for a Prime Minister Narendra Modi? You know, when I was born, Rena, no one had flown in space. All of this, the space commerce, you know, GPS satellites, weather satellites, telecommunications, uh, exploring the moon, exploring the sun, all of that has happened in less than one lifetime. So it's not so much a space race as it is a new space opportunity for everybody. And now the race is really uh, who can push the technology in an economic way to turn it into profitable space businesses for each of the companies and each of the countries involved. And India is in a really strong leveraged position to do that. And I think Prime Minister Modi has seen that for several years. You know, he is very much directly involved with the Indian Space and Research Organization, with Israel. You know, he he he's not just watching them do what they're do doing. He's He's very closely monitoring, but also involved in their conversations because it is national policy. It, it is pushing the wedge of technology forward so that all of those other businesses can be in behind that wedge 
uh, taking advantage of of all of the commerce that comes from satellites around the Earth, but also the Earth Moon economic system that is just starting to get going down on history, and then everything that lies beyond that. So yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a really smart move, I think, on India's leadership's part right now to be pushing it, to be developing it, but also being in the process of privatizing it so that the the businesses and therefore the Indian people can benefit as much as possible. Uh, what is your assessment about uh, Chandrayaan-3? Uh, the, fa- the findings so far look fantastic. Uh, with missions like Chandrayaan-3, what is the sig- significance of uh, the missions to the moon and why is it so crucial for space exploration? Well, Chandrayaan-3 really was like a, a, a test flight, right? It's the very first time you've ever done anything. And when you succeed at, at the fundamental purpose of a soft landing on the moon, it's almost like everything else that happens is, is sort of like an added bonus. Um, but in this case, the bonus is pretty significant. They have several sensors on board. They're, they're like detectors that look at, at, at colors and the spectrum of reflected energy. And from that, you can figure out what, what the moon is made of, at least near the South Pole. What's common in the dirt? And, and is there water? Is there oxygen? Are there minerals that can be mined? And Chandrayaan-3 is not going to answer all those questions definitively, but it's adding one more really important piece of information to everything we know so far. But it's the future of this that matters. India has shown its capability to land near the South Pole of the moon. That puts it at the forefront of of all the space nations on Earth. The moon is bigger than Africa, if you lay it out uh, on the surface of the world. It's a continent that is completely untapped, unmined, largely even uh, unsurveyed, um, bigger than Africa, that now suddenly we as a species have access to, and that India has direct access to. And we know from our remote sensors, there's on the order of 400 billion liters of water in the shadowed craters at the South Pole. So that step forward to untapped geological resources, uh, water, another place for human beings and robots to live and function, uh, we're just on the cusp of that right now. And, And to me, it's very difficult to predict exactly what what all the benefits and and you know uh, economic outcomes are going to be, but the potential is huge. It's like the time where we first started discovering the Americas or first started having access to Antarctica. It's one of those important irreversible thresholds in human exploration, and and it's great to see so many players involved with all of the of the possible benefits that are coming. All right. Um, Now, you are someone who's donned several hats, or shall we say just uh, several helmets, from an astronaut, from a commander of the International Space Station, a veteran, an author of the Apollo murders. Uh, So you'll also be releasing your next installment, The Defector, this fall. Tell us something about this and why uh, Defector. Uh, Rena, I've I've flown in space three times. It is an amazing experience. The Indian astronauts, when they fly in space and are up there for four or five days and orbit the world every 90 minutes, it is a life-altering understanding of the world itself. It is, it is a perspective that is so rare and so new in the human experience. But when when that has happened, what do you do with it personally? And I, you know, I'm speaking to you about it, but also I've I've done a whole television series about it, and and written a lot about it. And as you say, uh, I've I've written f- uh, four internationally best-selling books, and I have a new one coming out um, in October, uh, as you mentioned, called The Defector. And the purpose of it, Rena, is to try and share the experience, uh, this new human experience of spaceflight as as completely as I can. You know, I even play music about it because I I recognize just how few human beings have had a chance to experience it this this way so far. I've lived in space for half a year, been around the world 2,600 odd times. And the difference of that, the the depth of understanding, the change of a fundamental viewpoint that comes from it I, I don't want everybody to, to miss that. I want to share it as effectively as I can. And that's that's why I write about it. I I write nonfiction. 
but I also write fiction, thriller fiction, because it's, it's, it gives me so much more freedom to really share what it feels like. You know, what? how does everybody react? What goes right? What goes wrong? And writing uh, alternative history thrillers uh, that let people see just what might have happened and, and really get a gut feel of what space flight is like. That's why I wrote The Apollo Murders, and, and I'm releasing The Defector here in October. And The Apollo Murders is being made into an eight-part television series. So, so in addition to exploring space, I'm doing my absolute best to, to share it so that everybody can make it part of their own understanding and their own decision making as possible. Could you tell us something more about the defector? Uh, what is it all about? Um, is it fiction? Is it nonfiction? Yeah, the, my my new book is is the defector, and uh, it comes out October tenth. It is a thriller fiction, alternative history fiction. It's as as if. Uh, a couple things had changed in 1973, but it it starts um, in October of 73 uh, at, at the start, actually, of the uh, Yom Kippur War on October the 5th, October the 6th. And it follows the story of a Soviet defector in one of their top airplanes, the MiG-25 Foxbat. And it lands in um, in Israel and then uh, there are Americans there and the war and the American war support and that airplane and that pilot coming back to America and going out to one of the most secret flying locations in all of the United States out at Area 51 at Groom Lake and then revealing what the true purpose of the defection was. And almost everything that happened in the book is real, but it's so much fun to weave in a plot in amongst uh, astronauts and test pilots and the space program and, and the, the nuclear program that was going on. Uh, and this book goes through all of that to this huge uh, action pack conclusion at the end. Um, and all the early reviews for the book are just superb. Every, everybody that's had a chance to pre-read it has been really complimentary about the book so far. So I'm really proud of it. And I'm looking forward to getting it into everybody's hands and also the audio version and the digital version all coming out on uh, October 10th. Well, uh, good luck on that book and really looking forward to grab one of those. Um, uh, thank you so much for sharing your insight and your impressions about uh, these important missions uh, for ISRO, for India and the space fraternity. Thank you so much. Once again, appreciate it. Thank you, Rena. And uh... All good luck to the Aditya uh, launch coming up here very shortly.